The topic for today is the U.S. in world affairs. It is facile to point to America first as the driving force for the decline of U.S. influence and leadership. While no doubt the Trump administration has been an accelerant, the die has already been cast. America's inconsistent foreign policy and unforced errors have given the U.S.'s adversaries and competitors opportunities that they have used to their advantage. On the eve of the 2020 presidential election, our speaker, Jim Falk, will discuss the decline of U.S. power and, depending on the outcome of the elections tomorrow, where the next four years might take us. I'd like to tell you a little bit about our presenter. And uh, since 2001, Jim Falk has been president and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. His interest in international affairs was launched during his high school years, which were spent in Tunis, where he attended a French lycée. Jim graduated from Washington and Lee and earned his master's in foreign affairs and international law and organization and Middle Eastern studies from the University of Virginia. Following graduate school, he was director of education and press at the Middle East Institute in Washington. In 1982, he became a decade long career in banking, co concentrating on the energy sector. In 1992, he was Southern Regional Director of the Institute of International Education. He has been an honorary consul for the Kingdom of Morocco for Texas since 2013. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and serves as a member of the board of the North Texas Commission, the Executive Committee of the World Affairs Councils of America, and is an advisory director of the Asia Society Texas Center. Jim and his wife, Terrell, have two children and five grandchildren. Welcome, James. Please start your lecture. Thank you so much. And it's great to see you, meet you. Don, I remember when you called me and we were just reminiscing a few minutes ago. It was a, a year ago and I was eager to come to Chappaqua uh, because I normally would go to New York several times to meet with think tanks and publishers. And I thought, what fun to see your town. But uh, I regret that I'm not there today, but maybe perhaps one of these days soon I will be able to come. So thank you so much. And, and when you invited me, we certainly didn't know that I would be speaking on this eve of this pivotal election. Uh, in, in recent months, uh, and I've looked at your schedule, all of you have heard from uh, really uh, very top-notch academics, renowned academics, policymakers, and journalists, which probably have uh, brought to your fore more experience than I have. Yet I will say with my position at the World Affairs Council and my podcast and the television program that I co-host, I've had the opportunity to interview so many interesting people. And so sometimes I think that I'm a, a conduit for information, uh, which is what I'm gonna do today in part, but also uh, I hope convey some of my, my own thoughts. Going back uh, to read clips from newspapers and reporting, and all of us remember this, you, you think that the election that you're living right now is gonna be the most critical, um, it's the most important, it'll uh, determine the fate of mankind. Um, I'm gonna take the liberty to say that I really feel that uh, the election tomorrow is, is uh, really important um, because the two candidates, uh, Vice President Biden and President Trump, they're offering, and, and, and Don, you really made reference to this in, in the introduction, two distinct strategies uh, that they've both followed. I mean, the one thing about Vice President uh, Biden is we should never forget that he was on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, he was chairman of it. So you have quite a, a record of his thinking and the relationships that, that he's built up over decades. And we've certainly seen President Trump's strategy uh, over the last three years, and even going back to what he wrote uh, prior to becoming president. 
So whoever wins, they're really going to uh, impact uh, our country, I, I think, for years to, to come. Uh, tomorrow night, or, or probably more likely, uh, in a week or two, we'll find out if the Trump show is going to be uh, renewed for a second season, or will it be relegated to syndication? Um, you know, when you look at what Americans think about when they go to the cast their ballot, foreign policy is usually rated down below, fifth or sixth if we're lucky. Um, despite that, uh, whoever is the next president, uh, foreign policy has to be uh, front and center. Foreign policy uh, pundits, or what Ben Rhodes uh, uh, described as the blob, are, 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 of course, asking themselves, will there be a continuation of the Trump doctrine, which I think can be defined pretty simply as America first, um, where the United States has consciously stepped back from its long-held positions of leadership, leading closer to isola isolationism. Uh, some Trump supporters will say that, uh, look at the policy, not just the, or look at the actions and not just the rhetoric. Uh, I would uh, counter that by saying, look how European leaders and other leaders around the world um, are, are, are viewing the United States uh, so certainly the rhetoric uh, perhaps is even surpassing uh, some of the actions. People are asking if there is a Biden administration, uh, will he follow through with his campaign pledge to reassert the United States engagement uh, with the world by re-entering agreements that we've pulled out or withdrawn from? Will he, re -be will he be able to rebuild frayed alliances and we'll, how quickly and, and how will be, we be received as we rejoin, seek to rejoin various agencies and institutions that we've withdrawn from. So Don asked me to specifically address two questions. Uh, is our status as a hegemon being challenged? And if so, by whom? Uh, no secret, I think we know who we're being challenged by. But uh, first, let's go back in history and put this in context. Uh, following the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, what had been a bipolar world, um, United States and the Soviet Union, um, uh, it changed dramatically. Um, the question before us today then is to borrow from a chapter title from uh, Fareed Zakaria's new book, 10 Lessons from a Post-Pandemic World. Um, and I uh, encourage you all to, to read this book. Um, but one of his chapters is the world is becoming bipolar. And of course, we're referencing China. Uh, let's take a moment just to think about what hegemony means. It's, it's broadly defined as the dominance of one social group uh, of class in a society. In, in international relations, when we refer to it, we talk about the power of one nation uh, over others based primarily on military, but we should also think about uh, the economy, its influence on the economy, uh, cultural impact. Um, and, and so all of that fits into that, basically the ability to um, assert, to influence other parties, other nations. For the last three quarters of a century, the United States had been viewed as a hegemonic power, sometimes sharing it with the Soviet Union because of its ability to influence events, uh, stabilize currency, uh, leadership clearly in creating various important multilateral organizations ranging from the United Nations to NATO, uh, mobilization of its military uh, to mitigate conflicts, uh, as well as to assist in humanitarian crises. Um, for a period of time, uh, our leadership uh, during much of the Cold War was shared with the Soviet Union. Uh, and then clearly this arc of history uh, after the uh, changed after the fall of the Berlin Wall and uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union, then leaving the United States clearly as a hegemonic power, the sole superpower. And I think we've got a little too uh, confident. We showed too much hubris. Uh, we exercised our power during this time in a number of ways. Uh, some of it certainly was for the good. Uh, despite frequent criticism in the United States of the United Nations, 
Uh, the U.S. remained a very active participant in the Security Council as well as the General Assembly. Uh, because of our leadership there and the fact that we paid the highest amount of dues, uh, we usually could get our way uh, often uh, in the United Nations. Uh, outside of the UN um, and bilateral relationships because of our economic power, uh, the United States certainly was able to encourage our partners, our allies to support our policies. Um, to respond to Don's first question then, clearly the United States um, has been um, a hegemon and it is being challenged. And my response to, uh, in response to Don's other questions, uh, uh, China is challenging us in every single way. You know, it's interesting to look at over recent years about how China is described uh, as an ally, as a competitor, as an aggressor, as an adversary. And you can see that the, the language continues to change and not for the good. Uh, China is competing with us in every single area. Uh, obviously for, for the last what, 20, 25 years, it's been increasing where they've been uh, gaining on us economically and trade. Um, uh, militarily, you're seeing a, a dramatic change. We'll talk about that more in a few minutes. Uh, their soft power is what I'm really noticing um, you mentioned, Don, that I serve as an honorary consul for Morocco. Well, I remember when I lived in Houston, uh, back when the consulate, now closed, opened, uh, you saw the ping pong table and all of the Chinese diplomats were dressed in their Mao suits and um, they really could not speak English. Um, when you look at the consuls general that I've known over the last five, six years, uh, their knowledge of the United States, uh, the fact that they go on a track where they will not unlike uh, quite uh, different from our diplomats who often are, have a challenge in bec becoming really regional specialists. The Chinese diplomats uh, specialize in whatever area of the world. And when I look at the quality of their language skills and their knowledge of the United States, uh, completely different in uh, uh, 2020 20, uh, than it was 10, 15 years ago. Uh, small things, now of course, as I mentioned, the Consulate General is closed, but uh, over the last two or three years, uh, the then Consulate General would host a luncheon every month or so. Uh, he, uh, he or she would start sending gifts, uh, moon cakes, um, uh, hosting uh, large cultural receptions or events, performances. So re really spending an, an, an inordinate amount of money. And of course, as we know, there's been truly thousands of Chinese students that have been studying the United States. Um, during the years after the Cold War uh, and that the United States really was without a strong peer, um, there was not an ideological uh, alternative to the United States. Uh, Russia's distressed economy uh, showed its, its failings and its uh, global role declined and more and more countries looked to the United States and they, and they really saw that there was um, value to becoming a democracy. And you could see that uh, in Africa, as well as of course in Latin and South America. Um, multilateral institutions, um, largely established or led by the United States, grew in stature. Um, and uh, organizations that had supported the Soviet bloc uh, from the uh, Warsaw Pact or the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, uh, those are two of a myriad of organizations that were put together by the Soviet Union, uh, they were either um, just uh, ended. So what happened to get us to where we are today, where our leadership is being questioned, uh, both at home and, and abroad? Uh, you've heard from many of your prior speakers, and of course you had one of the key people from the Pew Foundation just a few weeks ago. Uh, the United States uh, stature in the world and its ability to influence foreign policy has certainly declined. Uh, I would suggest that um, much of this has been self-inflicted. And 
uh, we can't just point uh, to President Trump. Uh, there's been a, a number of factors that have contributed to this uh, over the last uh, decade or decade and, and a half. Um, some of this that I think would be key would be um, the 2007-2008 global recession, um, which really showed uh, that there was um, inequalities and problems with capitalism. Um, another one was um, the hardship, uh, while unintentional, uh, that was put on other countries and populations around the world by the IMF and the World Bank as they tightened down the screws on debtor countries, uh, which resulted in you know, high unemployment and hardship. And then we certainly have to consider the forever wars uh, led by the United States, but with support of um, many other democracies around the world, our friends in Australia and the UK and others uh, in the militarization of our uh, diplomacy, which led others to question our, our motives as well as our, our values. Uh, all you have to do is think about those horrible photos at uh, Abu Ghraib uh, to, to realize that uh, what, what propaganda, how that, how that could be used. Uh, Katrina, uh, the horrible hurricane, um, and, and the civil unrest, uh, perhaps fomented by, not perhaps, I think in large measure, or, uh, fomented by, by Russia and others, but clearly there is uh, civil unrest in um, uh, perhaps systemic racism in our country. Um, there is no denying though that President Trump's administration, his bombastic rhetoric has certainly uh, exacerbated uh, the way, way our, our ability to, uh, to influence foreign policy and it's given China a runway that I don't think they, they truly expected to have. Uh, the flurry of books, and I suspect many of you have read a number of these by John Bolton or Bob Woodward or, or others to name just a few. Uh, it certainly made Simon and & Schuster and other publishers happy. Um, but I also look at some of the credible reporting by David Ignatius or David Sanger, uh, as well as two books that I've recently read this year, uh, Robert Gates's uh, book, uh, as well as H.R. McMaster's to, to really see um, what, what President Trump's policies have been and the impact that it's had. Uh, just to refresh our memories, and when I worked on this last week, I was seeing the whole list. Uh, clearly, we think about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the withdrawal from that, which, which really happened on, I think it was the, the Monday after President Trump was uh, uh, um, took over, inaugurated, um, withdrew from that. Uh, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, the Global Compact on Migration, the Open Sky, here's some that we just don't necessarily think about, the Open Skies Treaty, clearly the JCPOA, the UN Human Rights Council, the UN Relief and Works Agency, World Health Organization, UNESCO. So this is just a partial list of international organizations that, that we have withdrawn from. Um, I, I really do think pulling out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership was one of the most egregious mistakes because uh, I was able to uh, hear some of the discussions taking place on that earlier uh, when it was just really a, a, a dream about a, a concept. And it was not just put together as all of you know for, for reasons for trade, it really was to be a bulkhead, a strategic bulkhead uh, to China. Um, let me just read this quote from Daniel Jurgen uh, about how the United States is viewed. Uh, the United States is seen by many countries as stepping back, increasingly unpredictable and no longer reliable, which increases the allure of engagement with China. He adds, countries are concluding that there is an advantage to attaching themselves to a rising China and engage China, rather to an America that may increasingly seem to some both inconstant and receding. So let's return now to Don's second question and look at just some specific ways that China has been expanding its global influence. Let's just take the UN for a moment. China now heads uh, four out of the 15 UN specialized agencies. Uh, in a sense, the vacuum that we have created uh, has, is being filled by China. 
Uh, clearly, um, China was able to influence the World Health Organization uh, during the uh, initial stages of the, of, of the pandemic. Um, and you can see now how China has, I mean, it's amazing when you think that the virus started in Wuhan and yet China is being perceived as handling it better than, than, than we are. Uh, they have contributed, I think it's close to $2 billion in assistance to other countries to combat the pandemic. We've actually contributed a bit more, but if you do a survey of when you've I've read these polls of asking people which country is contributing more to helping with the, the virus, uh, China comes out at, at top. One of the reasons for that, especially in the European countries, is in late March of this year, several months ago, uh, a joint statement was to be issued by the G7 uh, foreign ministers, and it was rejected to US insistence that the phrase Wuhan virus be included and that China, China be singled out as being responsible for the virus's spread. In the end, instead of a joint statement, countries released independent statements. And I've had the opportunity to talk with some ambassadors and uh, others um, who have been in the meetings uh, where President Trump has, whether it be the G7 or NATO or other organizations like that. And diplomats have actually been tiptoeing around President Trump so that there would not be an, um, um, uh, a period where he might say something that'd be radical or throw the meetings completely off kilter. And so often what you see in the communiques is really toned down because of uncertainty about handle, handling the United States right now. Um, an area that I long had an interest in is soft power, um, a term that I'm sure this group is well familiar with. And of course it was coined by Joseph Nye uh, the Harvard professor. And a simple way to understand it, going back to what uh, the Professor Emeritus says, soft power is used effectively, is being used effectively if it gives the holder the ability to set the agenda. And up until the early 1990s, where you really saw severe cutbacks in so many of the ways that we used, uh, invoked our soft power, uh, we were quite effective, but there's been such dramatic cutbacks from USIA, um, our educational programs, Fulbright, so forth. All of these have been reduced. Um, and again, who's filling the void? Uh, Farid Zakaria suggests that one way to measure power is the ability to get others to do what you want. In other words, setting the agenda. Today, we've arrived at a point, I think, where other countries are not afraid to say no to the United States. In fact, they almost gain credibility by doing so. And you can think about how Turkey has bought uh, the anti-missile uh, anti uh, defensive weapons uh, from Russia, the S-400s. You can think about how France and other countries all basically stayed with the JCPOA, the Iran deal, or even the UK's initial resistance to uh, boycott Huawei the Chinese uh, uh, company. Um, the other th sharp thing that we, important thing we need to remember is that President uh, Jinping Xi um, views China's place in the, role, in the world very differently than that offered by his predecessors. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations uh, senior fellow, Elizabeth Economy, another great book and a great speaker that you might get one day if you haven't describes uh, President Xi's strategy as China's third revolution, uh, following Mao's communist revolution and Deng Xiaoping's openness to the West. It's more assertive, it's competitive, uh, and um, he is very, very clear in his writings and speeches that he is pursuing, again, this is the Chinese president, China's rightful role of dominance in Asia. And just this past week, uh, where uh, the, in Beijing, they had what's called a Central Committee Plenum. Uh, unlike in prior meetings, there was no discussion of anyone being promoted or an adjustment in any line of succession. So uh, I think we're gonna see uh, President Xi uh, being in uh, power for uh, the foreseeable future. 
And of course, all of you have heard about the Belt and Road Initiative, which I didn't realize where it was announced until a few days ago. And it was announced in Kazakhstan uh, in 2013, purposely given there as a way to build support and truly demonstrate its, its reach. And um, nine years later, China has spent in excess of a minimum of one point, basically one and a half trillion dollars, which is seven times larger in today's dollars than the Marshall Plan. And uh, it was Bob Gates when I did an interview with him that reminded me that when she first announced it, it was called the Belt and Road Strategy. Uh, then it became One Belt, One Road because that sounded, according to PR firms, probably the way things are, probably a PR firm in the United States, that it was friendly or more touchy-feely than saying it was a strategy. There are now 131 countries that are participating in One Belt, One Road. And just a, a few data points on this. Ch a Chinese company now owns the majority share of the Port of Athens. The largest project is a 62 billion China-Pakistan economic corridor creating electrical power plants, railways, pipelines, etc. And closer to home, China now has, uh, is the second largest user of the Panama Canal, and it now owns the largest port on the canal. And there's a lot of discussion about you know, how China is viewed in Africa and the quality of their, some of their construction projects. Um, I would suggest that China is learning from its mistakes. Um, and so the Belt and Road um, or One Belt, One Road is, 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 is still a vital part of their strategy and is quite effective. Uh, they've been able to uh, also what's called the debt trap. You've seen this in Sri Lanka and many other places, especially in Africa where uh, countries have, have uh, taken loans out, they're unable to pay, especially now in the pandemic. And so China is able to gain uh, control of the assets that they, in quotes, financed. Um, and you know, usually when China makes an investment in these countries, there are no strings attached. So you'll often hear people say, well, the United States is different because um, US has allies and China doesn't. They'll say China's allies, North Korea, do you want that as an ally? And, I, and I, I understand that and appreciate that argument, but I would also say that China is playing for the long game in that because they have such economic power that uh, more and more countries are finding it difficult to extract themselves from China's grip. China has also formed uh, years ago what's called the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, 50 countries are, are members the United States had the opportunity to be a member, but turned it down. The United States put pressure on some of our friends not to join, including the UK. And uh, during the Obama administration, uh, the UK then became a member, uh, despite President Obama's pleas not to. Uh, sorry about that lawnmower I hear outside or a blower. I hope you're not hearing it. Uh, China has 30% uh, of the voting rights of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, export financing, China has given companies $670 billion from 2015 to 2017, while the US has contributed $590 billion to US companies through what was then called the American Export, Imp or is the American Export Import Bank during its full uh, history of eight decades. Um, in Africa, China has supported 2,300 projects worth over $94 billion. And uh, I was recently in Taiwan, well, not recently, it was a little over a year ago. And um, you know, of course, one of the key things for Taiwan is which countries have diplomatic relations with it. And um, African countries are recognizing Taiwan <clears throat> has now been reduced to just four. And clearly when China uh, when the People's Republic provides assistance, uh, one of the requirements, one of the quid pro quos is that they uh, 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 no longer have dipl diplomatic uh, with, withdraw their diplomatic relations with, with Taiwan. China is the largest trading partner for some 80 countries, maybe higher. China says 130. The reference I read uh, in the United States uh, said 80. Um, 
and China is the number one trading partner for, um, you know, as, as I said, uh, over 100, probably over 100 countries. Another program that's gotten so much attention is the Thousand Talents program, which was established in 2018 by the government to at first bring Chinese nationals who had studied in the United States to get them to come back to, back to China. Um, it's been a very effective way for China to be able to, uh, frankly, uh, facilitate legal and illicit transfer of US technology. And now it's not just for Chinese residents, it's also been expanded to recruit US professors. And I think all of you remember the famous case of the Harvard biology professor who was getting $50,000 a month uh, under this program, uh, Charles, Dr. Charles Lieber. So clearly there's some issues there. The Confucius Institutes, I don't know how active they are in your part of the country, but we had several in Texas. Uh, on the surface, they look like you know, very legitimate cultural organizations. They offer Chinese instruction, uh, Ch Chinese language instruction. They would put on art, perform uh, art exhibits, performances, but then you saw that they were actually spying on the Chinese students, whether it be University of Texas at Dallas or Texas A&M. So a large number of these institutes have been closed uh, in the United, from US universities. There are even some on high school campuses. I don't know how many. Uh, gigantic number of Chinese students studying in the United States. At one point, there were over a half a million, 500,000. Uh, because of a variety of reasons, they're now uh, just under 400,000. Um, China has built over 1,800 universities uh, in the last 15 years. And China surpasses the United States with the number of patents and the amount of money they spend on applied research. Turning to the military, uh, China has become much more aggressive with what it calls its uh, colloquially, the Wolf War Diplomacy, which is a, a movie franchise in China that shows China being like the Terminator, a very muscular China. Uh, China is spending, it's, it's the second uh, highest, uh, spends uh, country's second highest amount of money on military. Um, and, and that's just been increasing exponentially. Um, China uh, and spends uh, more than the top uh, four countries below it. Um, and that's just been uh, happening in the last, in the last de decade. Um, I think all of you, of course, are well familiar with China's activities in the South China Sea, although for a long period of time, they denied that it had any military purpose. Uh, China's naval assets are growing, uh, has two aircraft carriers now, and it has the region's uh, largest navy with over 300 ships. Um, and China has established <clears throat> its first foreign naval base in Djibouti. Um, an area that I think will be worth studying more about is uh, the ties now, growing ties between Russia and China um, as they look at a way to uh, counter the United States. Um, China and Russia have voted together in the US General Assembly um, something like 80, 86% 86 of the time. Um, I want to add that we are not alone in our increased concern about China. Um, NATO, and this was some remarks that Ambassador Hutchison said a few weeks ago when we had her as a guest, um, NATO countries are really realizing that China is an increasing threat and a competitor, uh, and they've been developing and gaming different scenarios vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Um, about two weeks ago, I interviewed Bill Drozdiak, who's written a really good book called The Last President of Europe about President Emmanuel Macron. Um, and he had, I think, at least four or five meetings uh, between uh, Bill and, and President Macron. And um, Macron has been emphatic that European, his European counterparts need to realize uh, the growing threat of China uh, militarily and economically. In hindsight, I think one thing that happened with us with our relationship with China is Americans like to be optimistic. And that's part of our DNA. And we believed that once China became a member of the 
um, uh, World Trade Organization. Uh, it would open up its economy and there would, I'm not gonna use the word regime change per se, but that the Chinese Communist Party would, would melt away. And as we know, that is, that is imaginary. Uh, Bob Gates in his chapter about China, he took a quote from Ronald Reagan and he says, the future is hard to, this is Ronald Reagan, the future is hard to predict, although I'm still betting on the triumph there of the tidal wave of freedom that is sweeping the world. A little bit later, George Herbert Walker Bush, who of course served in China, if people have commercial incentives, whether it's in China or in other totalitarian systems, the move to democracy becomes inexorable. Madeleine Albright recently said at a public meeting in the Council on Foreign Relations, China has no stake in democracy. China represents, and she says, a long and complicated threat, and we've gotten China wrong. Last week, National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien wrote in Foreign Affairs that our belief that China would become more liberal is a miscalculation that stands as its greatest failure of US foreign policy since the 1930s. In adding one more credible voice, Bob Gates, China will be the most complex, the most daunting, and potentially the most dangerous of the many foreign challenges the United States will face years ahead. So where does it leave us? The United States is, does have strong tools. We have the strongest economy. Our military might is still far superior. I do believe our allies are much stronger than China's and they are beginning to realize that China is a threat and that the United States is probably the sole country to lead in effort to be a counterweight. And there are ways that the relationship can be managed. Uh, just a week ago, Australia joined into a naval exercise uh, traditionally that Australia was not part of because we didn't want to sort of upset uh, the, the region. Well, the inclusion of Australia was designed to, to show our solidarity with the other countries that were participating. The FBI is becoming much more aggressive in uh, focusing on Chinese, China espionage. In fact, they open up a case apparently every 10 hours uh, where China has been involved in some form of, of espionage spying. Uh, there's a 2018 Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Acts, Act, which has new tools to vet foreign investments. And universities and corporations are being much more cognizant of hacking and piracy and espionage. And uh, the United States uh, has just recently approved another over $2 billion in arms sales to Taiwan to discourage uh, China from taking any aggressive action because you've seen that China has been uh, encroaching on Taiwan's airspace as well. Uh, in summary, the relationship is complex, but I don't think any party obviously wants it to become uh, a military conflict, but there will be tests. And as we've recently seen, as I mentioned with Taiwan and certainly what happened in Hong Kong with the National Security Act. Uh, we have to hope that these provocative actions won't lead to any type of accident. Um, the trade dispute with China continues and any progress on that has been curtailed as talks have stalled due to the pandemic. Uh, I would propose uh, in, in my final notes uh, that we're better off without the United States or any power really being viewed as a hegemon. Uh, China's trajectory has been probably accelerated in part because of the actions and the rhetoric taken in recent years by the United States, and particularly President Trump. Uh, President Xi is also part of that. Um, he tweets probably not as much as President Trump, but quite inflammatory. Um, and he's certainly been getting his country to rally around the flag. The key question for our policymakers and for all of us in this Zoom room is on what terms is the United States willing to accept a bipolar world where China in some areas is greater or equal to us? Farid Zakaria writes, what would be an acceptable level of influence for China given its economic weight in the world? If Washington, Zakaria says, does not first ask this crucial question, it cannot make serious claims about which uses of China power across the line. And so it's in everyone's interest for this relationship to be managed. An essential ingredient of that will, which is not easy for us as Americans, 
is to recognize and consider how China's view of its worldview, uh, and consider how China views its worldview, and for us to use our best abilities and all of our carrots and most of our sticks to manage the relationship. Thank you very much. Be happy to answer any questions about this or World Affairs Council. Thank you, Jim Falk. I am so impressed and pleased to have had you as our presenter today. I say that mainly because you were too modest in your introduction when you said there are other experts greater than you. I don't think so. I think your summary today puts you so far ahead of anyone else I could think of. So I, 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 do, I do appreciate what you have done, the depth of information that you've put together, and uh, it's, it's great. And it's interesting that you end up, of course, with China as the number one uh, hegemon perhaps to be. And uh, so the first two questions really that we have deal with China. The first one being that China is building these islands in the South China Sea and claiming then territorial seas around those islands. And one of the suggestions has been that the United States, instead of sending ships through the space that China claims and air, air, airplanes, could itself build uh, islands in those countries which have territorial claims on the same water. For example, the Philippines and Vietnam and those, those countries. And so I wanted, it's been proposed that building islands in their territories would bring us friendships with Philippines or whatever, and also not risk a military confrontation because the islands are what China is doing as well. So what did you, would you have any comment on that kind of an idea of building permanent places in the seas that other people claim? I think that would be very inflammatory. What I'd rather see um, would be for us to continue to show our strong alliance with Australia, rebuild our alliance if at all possible with Philippines. It may not be given the leadership there um, as, as well as Japan. And, and um, I just think doing that would be really throwing some uh, hot oil already on a fire. Huh. Well, <laughs> that's a, that's a uh a thoughtful response and maybe we won't go there <laughs> but i'd be curious that you know i I've, I've seen a little bit some articles on that i'd like to you know read more about it and, and see but it would worry me uh -huh, uh -huh. so do you have any alternative it's expensive to keep putting planes and ships through the china claims and i wonder yeah i think we need to continue to have our uh, naval assets there uh, we need to do these military exercises that we've done with other countries. Um, you know, it's always so dangerous to draw that, you know, red line in, in, in the sand <laughs> or in the ocean. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's very worrisome. The question that Joyce Lannert comes up with is how much does China's growing influence in Africa constitute threat to the U.S. over control of rare essential minerals? I, I think it's really a key. I mean, it's just how China, you've seen as well in the pharmaceutical industry. I have to tell you, I had no idea until last March that so much of our uh, generic drugs and Advil and antibiotics were made in China. I knew about India, but I, I really didn't know that about China. Um, and you're seeing China, uh, that's, got, you know, again, when you look at where China is making investments in South America, uh, Afghanistan, I mean, we, we talk about, you know, our forever war in Afghanistan, uh, while we're there with our military assets, China is building infrastructure and getting long-term concessions for some of the rare minerals uh, there. And certainly they're doing that in, in, in Africa. So I, I think it's very worrisome. As you mentioned and gave some statistics on uh, China's military investments and growth, one of the questions that 
uh, uh, Colonel Wilkerson asks and is talking about these days on YouTube and elsewhere is that he finds one of the major problems that America faces is that its defense budget is so enormous it doesn't lead to innovation. And he mentions the fact that uh, with adding to the defense budget, those are the budget of the CIA and the US intelligence budget, etc., were up to $840 billion per year in American investment in its, in its defense. And he's, his idea is that that number is just obscene. And he was in the, uh, in the White House at one time as part of their advisory people. So I wondered if you could either say something in support of what <laughs> Wilkerson is saying or- I, 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 I agree with him. Um, you, you didn't mention, but my, my father was in the Department of State. And so I you know, followed that and obviously my career in this nonprofit world. I've uh, known so many diplomats and I've just watched how the State Department for a variety of reasons, its influence and ability to affect events has declined while the military has um, continued to go up. And part of it is because the military has assets that it sells. And you know, I've had discussions with key diplomats like Orion Crocker or Ross, uh, uh, Mark Grossman, who have served in Pakistan and Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, they have to find a commercial flight often to get to their post. And you know, the, oh. the general has his plane or the admiral has his ship. And, uh, and, and then um, here in Dallas, uh, we're one of the um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we're, the, and I should know this, but I don't, but we're probably the largest defense city in, in the United States uh, region when you look at Raytheon and Lockheed and uh, all the other um, defense companies that are here. Um, you look at the F-35. I mean, uh, you know, lots of people just say that is you know, money that should not have been spent or it's certainly way over budget. Um, but when you have uh, so much uh, pork barrel politics. Uh, I think the F-35 is built in probably over th parts of it in over 30 states and God knows how many countries. It's awful, awfully difficult to, to pull it back. Um, but I, I truly hope that, um, I'm, I'm trying to be uh, nonpartisan, but uh, um, I, tr I truly hope the next administration is able to uh, bring the State Department back to its uh, former influence. And one thing that's been discussed, um, and, let, and let me, well, I'll finish the thought. One thing that's been discussed is there've been so many resignations at the Department of State. And usually when you resign, you're out, but maybe there'll be a way to bring people back in. And Don, um, Mark Grossman, I don't know if you all are familiar with him, but Mark was, had the third highest uh, position in the State Department's ambassador to Turkey. And when Richard Holbrook uh, passed away, uh, Mark took his position. Uh, ambassador Grossman, uh, Ambassador Nick Burns, and an ambassador from Georgetown, they've all been working on a special project. Do you know about this project? No, no. It's a project uh, to reform the State Department. And oh, yeah. he would be a terrific speaker for your group. Uh, to, for him to give his report and for you all to yeah. provide valuable yeah. feedback you. about how you see it. And I'll, I'll send you, uh, I'll, I'll do a, a note of introduction uh, for you to, to Mark. Well, your other comments on hegemony it was on the front page of the New York Times today in that their piece on the uh, President Trump's promise to make uh, Juan Guaido the head of uh, Venezuela and supporting him against the uh, incumbent uh, Maduro. And instead of America having that kind of an influence on Venezuela, just the opposite has happened where, the, uh, where Maduro is even more ensconced and uh, we don't hear any more about uh, Juan. So <laughs> these kinds of actions around the world, as uh, America sort of either withdraws or loses its hegemony, is important because at one time in the past, of course, when I 
and you're were alive, we simply went in and killed the leader of Chile and <laughs> or encouraged it to be in order to have influence in the South America. But we don't have that today. So I don't know whether you want to comment on the, the no, I mean, affairs with Venezuela or not. But no, I, I mean, uh, you, you've, you've encapsulated it very well. Um, and, and that is an example of where the United States has tried over, you know, what, three, four years to uh, um, have a, a, ch a change in, in government. We're unable to do it. Um, and I, I will say I am against regime change. We are not, as, as people much more knowledgeable and active than I am, we are not very good at it and we have not been. Um, and You're not in the long run, for example, yeah. Yeah, and you know, you go back to the early years of the Cold War, uh, um, you look at Congo and Angola, uh, those are two countries where we spent so much money in trying to influence the government and all we did was hand it over to, um, you know, to communists. Um, you look at, um, uh, I'm forgetting, Lumumba, not Lumumba, um, the head of, anyway, one of the former leaders in the Congo, not Mobuto, and he would have been a, a socialist leader, but we uh, arranged for his overthrow and yeah. there you go. Yeah. So uh, um, sometimes it's better for us just to uh, let events uh, proceed without us getting involved, which is hard for us to do. <laughs> uh, Evelyn, who's one of our board members, asks you the question, is there re really a decline in U.S. power, or is Europe using Trump's personality as a red herring to hide its unwillingness to give up business with Iran and China? Hmm. That's a very good question, a good point. Um, I don't think so. I, it may play a partial role, uh, but I, I think, um, especially on the JCPOA, which has been one of the critical points, um, and we could have a whole nother hour on this, and I'm sure many of you in the audience have strong feelings about it. Look, the JCPOA was not perfect, and um, I wasn't in those negotiating rooms, and I, there's a lot about it I don't like but it was an agreement that, uh, uh, while not a treaty, it was an agreement. And uh, when we pulled out of it, uh, the other countries decided to stay in, and I think they were right in doing so. And uh, so, uh, and part of that agreement was that um, France and Germany and so forth, Italy would, 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 would uh, European countries would be able to establish uh, business relationships once again with Iran. So uh, uh, I, I think that they're, they're not in the wrong in doing that. I hope um, that if there is a new administ a Biden administration and what he has said is that um, he will renegotiate the JCPOA and I hope he's able to do that. Well, Evelyn's question sort of tilts us towards Europe and where Europe is at the moment. And the people who support Trump uh, say that one of the things he has done is a, awaken Europe to its responsibilities towards NATO. That's true. And uh, you might want to comment on that oh. because I think that, uh, as my father used to say to us, what, if you're now you're big enough and ugly enough, you can start looking after yourself. <laughs> and so Trump, in a way, has applied that my father's rule to, to Europe. Well, and, and I think that's a good point. However, I would say that um, when you look at what the agreement was, was that the European NATO countries would uh, contribute 2% of their GDP um, to defense by 2022, I think was the date. Um, whether or not they would have done it by then is another question. And, um, I, mean, I, I can tell you in talking to uh, Bob Gates about this just a few weeks ago was one of the questions I asked him. Uh -huh. He said that he and others had been, you know, pushing Europe, European countries to increase their defense budgets for a very long time. 
Um, but clearly, President Trump has been very has been effective in in doing it. And um, also, though, what's interesting is because of European leaders' concern, whether justified or not, with President Trump's support of the NATO alliance and other alliances. Uh, I think Europe is being much more conscious of its need to defend itself. Uh, President Macron, relatively unsuccessfully so far, has talked about building a European military. Can't imagine that really working. Yes, yeah. He's talked about that. Um, so I, I, I and, and you know, I, I do want to say where I can, in my view, bash President Trump in a number of ways on his foreign policy successes, uh, that there are not many. I'm amazed by what's happening in the Middle East, just flabbergasted. I would have never uh, thought this would work the way it is. The Palestinians are left in the cold um, and the Arab countries are essentially abandoning them. But if this may add to, may, may contribute to real stability in, in, in the region, uh, although the Palestinians are one left out but I would not have expected this to work the way it has. And uh, the proof will be in the pudding. I mean, let's see what happens. Is, can we look back in two or three years and say this was a successful, uh, successful policy? Yes, yes, I think. Don? Um, Amal, you had a question for our, our yeah. presenter. Yeah, I'm, I'm just staying with, with the, what Jim has just covered. You can put your Let's, face back on. You want me to put my face back on? All right, I'll do that. <laughs> I gotta get I gotta get my cursor to move to the right. <laughs> Play, got it. Uh, how's that? Oh, there you, go. Yeah, there you are. Another, another triumph of science and technology. <laughs> Going to the Middle East, let's just suppose that the Jim, you're right. They've been successful. The, our government has been successful in terms of the Arab states. Does it strengthen or not strengthen our ability to deal with Iran, which is opposed to all those Arab states? Where do we come out on all that? Yeah, and when you see that the United States has promised to sell F-35s to UAE and God knows whatever else we're providing, uh, you know, UAE wants that not for Israel, obviously, but for Iran. Um, and I you know, really feel that that shows the need to try to bring Iran back into some, some semblance of rationality. Um, you know, most of you on this call, I suspect, are as old as I am, if not older or a little bit younger. And to think that we are in this situation with Iran since night, prior to 1979 is such a shame. And both countries, have gotten closer to, got close to establishing some type of uh, detente. Um, and then something went wrong, either in the United States, hardliners in the United States or hardliners in Iran. And it just hasn't happened. But when you look about how we were able to have diplomatic relations with uh, 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 clearly Vietnam, um, and even going back to looking at you know other past enemies. The fact that we're still at this situation with Iran is, is very sad. Um, but you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, Iran uh, is now more than ever the destabilizing force. I would say, and many of you may disagree, and it can always change, but I think Iran is largely a rational player. Um, but, you know, their continued support of Hezbollah uh, especially in, in Syria and, and threats around the world to kill diplomats um, is, is really troublesome. And uh, I do worry greatly um, that after we um, assassinated uh, the Iranian general, um, and you know, there's there a good argument for doing that, but I think um, their retaliation is still, is still there. Can we go for a little bit further? Because the question you raised, though, is does our selling of the F-35s or our selling of the Raytheon uh, equipment to uh, Saudi Arabia, does that strengthen or weaken our ability to deal with Iran? Or does it simply take us to the point where we may have a different kind of military 
conflict in the region? I think the sale of the F-35 and the assets, the Raytheon assets to Saudi Arabia was part of the quid pro quo to get UAE to formalize what was already happening. I mean, UAE and Israel have had good relations for a very long time uh, on, across a number of areas. Um, I, I, I think we're just gonna have to see. Um, I, I, I guess you could certainly argue um, that by selling the F-35 to the UAE, um, and they'll probably be, um, you know, all the pilots are being trained here, um, that that will, you know, keep Iran, make, make Iran come to the table uh, sooner rather than later. I, I hope that that may be the case. And, you know, if, if you, I, th I think it's again critical to get the JCPOA back in, 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 in place because Iran now um, is not in compliance with what was in the original agreement. And the last thing, you know, while I say that Iran is not as irrational as some may think, I sure don't want Iran to have nuclear capability, nuclear weapons. Can we broaden back to one of your original sets of points? We, when you look ahead, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or- Or next week or, or next week now. or whatever, but we don't know what the results is. Yeah. But what do you, the people you talk to, the people that you have some confidence in, what do they think? A, what is the likely Trump foreign policy if he wins? B, <laughs> what's the likely Biden foreign policy once he, and, and what's the difference between the two, if any? Oh, I, I, I think, you know, in a number of ways, there's going to be a, a critical difference. Um, one of the things that I think is very interesting about President Trump's campaign is, can you tell me what his policy, what his strategy is, what his agenda is for a second term? Stop people at the border. Right. So, I mean, there's really no change. Normally, in a second term, there's a lot of speculation about who's going to resign and key post. Uh, you really haven't seen anything about that. I don't know if that's because the media uh, is just assuming that there will be a Biden administration. But you know, there's been no talk about who would step down on, in a second Trump administration. I tend to think that the key people around him would stay in the foreign policy realm. Um, I mean, I don't see O'Brien or Pompeo or Gina Haskell has too much loyalty to the agency to, to step down. Uh, so I personally don't think there'd be any type of key change. I think it would be a continuation in um, emphasis on what he's been doing. I, I, clearly, I think you would see um, more countries in the Middle East uh, come into the normalization of relations with Israel. And the first one probably will be uh, Morocco. Saudi Arabia, I think, will be the last. With a Biden administration, and you all, I'm sure, read the same articles I read about the large number of people who are vying to be Secretary of State and key positions, um, where President Trump, uh, you remember the first foreign country he went to, Saudi Arabia? I think President Biden, a, a President Biden has said that his first uh, trip would be to Canada um, and then he would head to Europe very quickly. So I think he would be a member of the 100,000 million, 100,000 mile club pretty quickly uh, to go to Europe. And you'd see lots of, I was about to say hugging and kisses and handshakes, but not anymore, but you'd see elbows being given, masks being, <laughs> but I, I, I think he would, and, and he has said that um, he will try to join the, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, WH, uh, World Health Organization. Um, and I think he would really seek to reestablish our relations with all these other multilateral organizations. Uh, I don't, you know, again, one of the so interesting things about President Trump's administration, and I'm sure you all have heard this and read it a hundred times, don't listen to what he says, look at the policy of the US government and the US government policy towards Russia has been um, pretty strong against uh, Russia. 
uh, in a number of ways with sanctions. Um, so I think that would continue with a Biden administration. Uh, the difference would be that um, uh, Biden would, would not cozy up uh, to uh, 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 um, Putin. Uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't see a redo, a repeat of the Helsinki summit. I, th I think in short, there'll be really, as I said in my first remarks, there'll be a very different uh, public appearance um, and um, behind the scenes, it'll be very different as well. The question we turn in, to in the, the discussion, Mal, the question we talked about was looking ahead, say 10 years, and the continual rise of China. And if uh, America becomes less than the hegemon in that 10 years from now, Jim, what do you, what do you see as uh, America in that? second position and that second level, as it were, position, if that were to occur. I, I, I really hope 10 years from now that um, we will go back to sort of the traditional US policy and that we will be able to um, coexist with China. There will be areas of sharp disagreement and there'll be areas where we're gonna work together and one thing that you're seeing with China and whether or not <laughs> this is truly a, a change in philosophy or, or, or more just because they're trying to exert their, exert their power and gain more power is where China had been very reluctant to play on the world stage. And they really allowed the US and, and Russia to take those positions. Uh, China is much more engaged. Um, and, you know, I. I'd like to believe, and I hope this is right, that China, unlike Russia, China is not trying, I don't think, to promote its ideology. It's not trying to turn other countries into you know, the CCP, um, but they want economic uh, flexibility and power. And that's the difference, say, than the Cold War that we had with, uh, with the Soviet Union. Going back to your question of about the question about what you think a Biden administration might want to do. Are there any significant challenges, domestic or foreign, ideological, political, structural, that would hamper us from accomplishing either the formulation of a new policy or the execution of the policy? Is there something that we're not looking at that makes it hard? So for example, Don talked about uh, Colonel Wilkerson. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've almost baked into the system the fact that we're going to spend a lot of money on defense, whether it's useful or not. Yep. That's his, that's, are there other kinds of things that make it difficult to change the direction? Yeah. Well, I think, and, you know, Richard Haas and among others, you know, Richard Haas's book, The World in Disarray, um, and then his emphasis, as well as others, that we have to start spending money at home. And how do you get that to happen? I mean, our infrastructure is falling apart. We need to spend more money on education or spend it intelligently. Uh, I don't have these figures at the top of my head to quote them, but I know the trends in the United States and education is falling far behind. And that's at uh, elementary through high school and even universities now. Uh, you're seeing uh, the rise of the rest. We may be, I'd like to say that we're staying constant, but I think we're declining in, in other countries are, are uh, uh, beginning to surpass us, certainly in education. You're absolutely right about the mili you know, military industrial complex. Uh, I mean, I have so many friends in this town, in this city that work in the, in the, in the military um, for defense contractors. Uh, there's so much pork and barrel here. Um, you know, uh, Raytheon, I think, uh, is the second or third largest employer in Dallas-Fort Worth. You would never guess that. You'd think it'd be American Airlines would be one of the top, and they are. But it's amazing how many jobs are tied to defense. Um, it's going to, you know, there was years ago when they were able to close a number of U.S. military bases. That's when they set up that team. I think it was senators or, or maybe it's both senators and, and uh, representatives of Congress. 
and they did their secret meetings and they were able to develop that list and then go out there and close all these military bases. And there was hardship, certainly in a number of towns and cities. But I think it's gonna be very, very difficult for us to change some of these key infrastructure. So in, in, in short, more money in education, domestically, infrastructure, um, and we have to figure out a way to, in some way, reduce the, or at least uh, not spend as much money in defense and add it up where we're uh, in, in diplomacy and, and soft power. Soft power doesn't have to be, you know, all cozy feely. You can see what China's been able to do with it. We need to do more of that. Well, a question has come in, uh, Jim, from Lorraine Ginsburg, and she asks, uh, how will we deal with China's human rights violations? Well, I think you will see in a Biden administration, human rights again be uh, uh, front and center. Um, clearly, uh, I, I hope that we'd be able to put in some effective sanctions, uh, especially with the Uyghurs and other human rights violations that you're seeing. And, and God, what you're seeing in Hong Kong is really, really disturbing. And again, you know, I mean, Obama got in trouble for the red line in Syria, and that was certainly a, an error. Um, we have to be able to get back to where we can build up support for our positions um, by our own values and be able to exert pressure on a country like China. Absolutely good, good point. It's not going to be easy, but we, we shouldn't just withdraw and let these things happen, which has been, in my view, sadly, the policy for the last, during this administration. Jim, you've been going for an hour and 20 minutes with yeah. great gusto and lots of information. So we're going to thank you for well, thank participating you. today. If I may just say one thing before, because I think it was mentioned, could I make a pitch about the World Affairs Council? Please. Not ours, but around Please the country. <laughs> well, yeah, because I don't know, I was, it was mentioned that maybe some of you don't really know about the World Affairs Council. We are not chapters. The World Affairs Council was established uh, uh, essentially when the League of Nations was not ratified. And there was a belief that they didn't want to have just a bunch of white men in, sorry, New York and Washington make all these decisions. They needed to be uh, organizations throughout the United States that would engage the American public in foreign policy. Uh, so the, one of the first was, or the first, was the Foreign Policy Association in your state in Manhattan. And then slowly the movement went north and west. And they're now about, oh, 85 or so World Affairs Council. Some are quite large, like ours in San Francisco and Houston and New York. Others may be just totally run by volunteers, um, but all of them are nonpartisan. They are not chapters, they're all individual. Uh, we are engaged in education programs uh, for high school students. Uh, some just do speaker programs, but I would encourage you to um, I'd love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel at DFW World, Dallas Fort Worth, DFW World, or go to worldaffairscouncils.org to see about the whole uh, other, what, uh, what other councils are offering. You will always find good programs to, to participate in. Thanks for letting me give that commercial. Yeah, we got well, you. can I we add to another that? Com another commercial if you want, because before we went on air, you were talking about San Jose. Santa Fe. Or Santa Fe. <laughs> yeah, I'll be moving to Santa Fe, I hope. Uh, if anybody wants to buy a house in Dallas, this one's available. <laughs> but we're, uh, it's the, the for sale signs out there. But we'll be moving to Santa Fe. And one of the reasons is because they have such a good World Affairs Council. I see. Mal, back to you. Well, I also want to add to what Jim has said in the sense that the national organization also publishes once a week on, on, on the, a, a, uh, an email that has lots of insight. And that's an, uh, something I hadn't known a year ago, but I get to see it every week. And there are lots of tips uh, about what's going on across the World Affairs Council world, but beyond that. But to Jim, it's obvious that in a hundred years, the World Affairs Council has gained a lot of of uh, prominence, a lot of, of uh, support. So when you mention Elizabeth economy, we tried mightily to get Elizabeth economy, but with only 20 years of background and only a hundred members or 150 members, it's a little hard to compete with people like you uh, to get well, people of that stature to come to 
us, even if it's from the from the security and comfort of their own homes. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, but maybe I can help you with that. We would love that. And to but make you laugh, I'll tell you what I'm doing tonight because I think people are tired about politics. I'm glad you guys aren't. Tonight I'm hosting a program and I'm mentioning it because they're in New York. Do you know about the monks of New Skeet? No. They yes. Are, I, yes. Yes, the German shepherds. I am having- Well, don't, for, don't forget the cheese. The cheese. And the cheesecake. Oh, I'll find out about that tonight. I'm interviewing uh, them about the art of training your dog. I thought people needed a break from CNN and Fox. <laughs> so if you're interested, if you have a dog and have dog problems, tune in tonight. <laughs> well, there are, there are two groups up there in Northern New York. One is the men who train the dogs. And then there's a group of nuns about a mile away who do cheese and cheesecake and other kinds of things that are absolutely delightful. They are a terrific group to, to be dealing with. I'm glad you told me. I'll bring that up tonight. <laughs> Thanks to our guest, Jim Falk. We really you, appreciate Alan. your contribution to us today. To our thanks to Don Shields, our moderator for today, to Joan Kuhn, the library, Carrie Krams, who you saw only earlier, who from the New Castle Media Arts Center, and for all of you who have joined us today. In two weeks, November the 16th, we will host Isaac Stonefish of the Asia Society, who will address the topic, Beijing's influence in America. Don Shields will again be our session facilitator. If you have family or friends who would like to join us this fall, please mail Joan Kuhn, J-K-U-H-N at WLSmail.org so that we may add you to the invitation list. Until we meet again on November the 16th, please be well and be safe. Thank you, Jim.